in person and online and we're going to like I mentioned last Sunday we're going to keep staying deep in this uh, teaching on renewing the mind it's very important and I, I appreciate the feedback I got from last Sunday just how much this is needed in the body of Christ how much this is needed to renew the mind and so anyway we're going to just continue I'm not sure exactly how long we're going to be talking about renewing the mind but it, it could be four, five, six weeks, we'll see. But um, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And most of us know this, this scripture, but I just want us to really focus on it here in this message. As Paul is writing and he says, do not be conformed to this world. And let me pause right there and say this that you will naturally, if you do not take decisive action in renewing your mind, your thinking is going to be right along with this world, the spirit of the age. It's going to be right along with the Babylon that's rising up in this day and age. As Revelation 17 and 18 talking about, there is a, the, the Babylon is rising up, Babylon being both a city that will emerge in the end times, Babylon being a system that will emerge, Babylon that is a spirit that has been around since the beginning, that Babylonian thought that is now penetrating into the cultures of this world, those thinking patterns will naturally conform you into the spirit of the age unless you learn how to take decisive action to renew your mind. It's so important, okay? So especially if you're younger, if you're younger, the, the spirit of the age will warp your mind into thinking like the world instead of thinking based on the truth of God's word, thinking based on the culture and what the culture values rather than the truth of God's word. We must learn how to meditate. We must learn how to renew the mind. We must learn how to spot the lies of the devil and agree with the truth of God's word. Jesus said in John chapter 8, he said to his disciples, or he said to those who believe in him, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Freedom comes by the truth. Captivity comes by the lie. And if you are believing the truth, you're going to, you're going to live free. And if you're believing the lie, you're going to be in bondage. And the problem is there are webs, these complex webs of lies that are just these entangled thoughts that come from many, many different sources that we are believing. And when, we be, when our faith puts, when we begin to put our belief into a set of lies, it begins to shape and conform who we are. And Paul is writing here, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but he says, but be transformed. Now, this word is a very interesting word in the Greek. It's metamorpho, from which we get the word metamorphosis. And Paul is saying, just like, just think of metamorphosis. Think of the caterpillar who becomes a butterfly. The caterpillar becomes a butterfly. He's, this caterpillar is metamorphosized into a butterfly. The caterpillar doesn't become a different animal or an insect. The caterpillar becomes or is changed into a different state. See, a lot of us think or we blame God and we say, God, why are you allowing this to happen? God, why am I going through this? God, why is my life such a mess? And the problem is we shouldn't blame God. The problem is most of the time it comes down to what we're thinking right here between our two ears is what is our what is our mind like what is our mind like your life is a reflection of what's in your mind everything that you think is is really the the the, the situation the fruit that is going on in your life is the product of the way you think as a man thinks so he is if we don't learn to transform our mind, we will never become a bride made ready. The bride being made ready will be a bride who has a transformed mind. 
a metamorphosized mind, a metamorphosis that, see, God wants us to learn how to think differently, to change states. See, we have the potential to live in a carnal state that's ruled by the flesh, ruled by the soul, ruled by our own thinking, ruled by our own emotions, where the, the old man is ruling and reigning, or we have the potential to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And depending on how we think, that determines how we live. Our, your meditation always always, always determines your orientation. Whether you live from the spirit, whether you live from the soul, or whether you live from the body. Your meditation, that, that is a law of God that cannot be violated. Your meditation always determines your orientation. Whether you live from the spirit, from the soul, or from the body. So if you're living a carnal, soulish life, I'll tell you the reason why it's because of your thinking. And if you're living a spiritual life, I'll tell you the reason why it's because of your thinking. Your mind determines whether you live in the flesh or whether you live in the spirit. Now let's look at now Romans chapter 8 where Paul, oh, hold on, actually I didn't finish the whole verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. Well, we're going to dive into this even deeper in a minute. But by the renewing of your mind. Now, let's, let's flip over to Romans chapter 8, and where Paul is talking about the life in the spirit or life in the flesh. And he, in verse 5, I want you to just get this drilled into us deeply. For those who are according to the flesh, in other words, what Paul's meaning is those who live based on the flesh, those who are living by their sin nature, those who are carnal, those who are living by what the five cravings, their, the, sin, the five senses of the body crave, or the mind, the will, and the emotions uh, are thinking, feeling, and wanting, those who live by that, those things working together, those who live by the flesh, he said, he said they, they, they live by the flesh because they set their minds on the things of the flesh. Whatever you set your mind on, whatever, whatever you set your mind on is going to be how you live. If you set your mind on the flesh, you're going to live by the flesh. If you set your mind on the spirit, you're going to live by the spirit. He says, but those who, who are according to the spirit or those who live by the spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now notice what verse 6 says. For the mind that is set on the flesh is death. When your mind, if you ever have experienced that spiritual death where, where you get feeling of condemnation, depression, anxiety, overwhelmingness, uh, that's not really a word, over, being overwhelmed, feeling rejected, oppressed, heavy. A lot of, that, that's the spiritual death that you're experiencing that reason, you're experiencing that because your mind is set on the flesh. And Paul says, but the mind that's set on the spirit is life and peace. If you're not experiencing the life of God or the peace of God, it's because your mind is not set on the spirit. He goes on to say in verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. That's, that's some pretty hard, hard words there. That if our mind is set on the flesh, if we're set on the things of the flesh, the things of the world, what our body wants, what we want, when we want, how we want it. If our mind is set on, the, on those things, no matter how nice of a person you are, how good of a person you are, Paul says that mindset means when that mind is set on those things, you will be hostile to God. That's strong language. That's strong language. You will be hostile to God. Because the mind set on the flesh, it cannot subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Even though God loves you, when your mind is set on the flesh and the things of the flesh, 
You cannot please God. The carnal mind cannot please God. Only the spiritual mind can please God. So it's very important that we learn how to meditate, how we learn how to think different. And so we're going to talk about, just over these next few weeks, the importance of biblical meditation. Now, just as we talk about biblical meditation, it's very important that we understand that, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Biblical meditation is so very important. You know, again, I said it last week, but when you think about meditation, don't think of someone in yoga pants, palms turned upward, and, and you know, doing yoga or Hinduism or New Age, trying to release the best version of you out of you. That's not at all what, what meditation is in Scripture. Okay, a lot of Christians have said they've seen the New Age or they've seen the Hinduism, and they said, we don't want that because we don't want a demon, and they've rejected biblical meditation. But the Scriptures are clear. The Scriptures are full of... of uh, Truths that tell us, of exhortations that tell us uh, the importance of meditation. You, you must meditate. You must meditate on the Word of God. We, we must recover meditation. We must recover this. In Joshua 1.8, the Lord told Joshua, I want you to see this. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Did you catch that? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, God is giving Joshua, and I believe God is giving us a commandment that the word of God must not depart from your mouth. That would mean we need to speak it. That would mean we need to sing it. That would mean we need to write it. That would mean we need to proclaim it. We must speak the word. You can't meditate if you just sit there and try to think about it. Meditation involves speaking. You see that? The, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Uh, Psalms 1 2, David says that you shall meditate, the righteous man meditates day and night on God's word. And, and so this Hebrew word for meditate in all these verses is haga. And this word, this is what this word means. I want you to listen to this. It means to moan. Okay, I don't really think, it, it, you know, I'm not going to meditate in the morning. I'm going to be like, you know, moaning in the morning. I'll wake my family up. But it means to moan. That's voiced. It means to growl. Okay, so even the word of God tells us we should be Georgia Bulldog fans. It means to utter, to utter. That, so, see what I'm saying here? We're, 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 you're seeing when the word meditation is not just thinking. It's, it's what we voice, moan, growl, utter, to muse. Okay, that's a thinking word. To mutter, to meditate, to devise, plot, speak. So what I'm getting at is biblical meditation must be voiced. It's, it's not merely just thinking. Now, thinking is part of it, but it's this full, immersive process that involves voicing the Word of God that renews your mind and renews your heart. It, it is a process of meditation that changes your brain, changes your mind, and changes your heart by thinking, pondering deeply, and voicing it, whether you voice it by speaking, whether you voice it by writing, whether you voice it by singing, it, the Word of God has to be released in your mouth to engage in biblical meditation. That's what Scripture teaches. That's what it means to renew your mind. So I just want to encourage you, begin to speak the Word. Begin to write the word. Begin to sing the word. You've got to voice it in this full immersive process of meditation to fully engage the mind and transform the mind and change the heart based on God's truth. 
Now, if you get up at early in the morning like I do, and then you don't want to wake up the whole family and get your dog stirred up and stuff like that, I can't really speak the Word of God out loud in the morning because it'll wake my family up. So I write it down. I write down all the time my meditations. And, and there's something about writing down your thoughts and your meditations in a journal or whatever. There's something that, that connects your brain to your heart to your mind that does something of transformation in you. I, I'm telling you just from many years of doing this, this is probably one of the, this is one of the highest things, one of the number one things that has changed me, has transformed me, is learning to write down my meditations on the truth of God's word. And I want to encourage you, to, if you don't do that, I want to encourage you to begin to, to put this into your discipline of prayer. Put this, make this a habit in the way you pray. We'll have a session that talks about that later. But I just want to encourage you to, to make that change in the way you pray where you're voicing the truth of God's word and, and this meditative process. Okay, so biblical meditation is not new age. Biblical meditation is not Hinduism. Biblical meditation is not reading the Bible. Biblical meditation is not studying the Bible. Now, obviously, I believe in reading the Bible, and I believe in studying the Bible, but that in and of itself, we need to do both of those things, read the Bible, study the Bible. But those two things are not biblical meditation. Okay? What biblical meditation is, is spirit-led meditation is when we take a biblical truth or promise that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, inscribed in Scripture, and we ponder it, and we think about it, and we write it, and we sing it, and we voice it until that truth becomes your own. The Scriptures are meant to become your own. The revelation Paul had, the revelation John had, the revelation James had when the Spirit of God illuminated and revealed the truth of God's Word, that revelation in the Word of God is meant to be your own truth. Uh, the, par the parable of the sower in Matthew 13 says, because these in there are certain individuals in this parable, they didn't have a firm root in themselves, they didn't have ownership of the Word, it wasn't in them, they didn't have ownership of it, and because they didn't have ownership of it, they fell away. You cannot depend upon the faith of your pastor or your elders or your favorite Bible teacher or your parents. Your faith must be your own faith. This word must be your own word. You must have ownership of the truth of God's Word. The revelation John got, the revelation Paul got, the revelation James got, that revelation, what meditation does, it takes that truth written in Scripture and it ponders and it thinks and it, and it meditates and it muses and it voices and it expresses and it writes and it sings until that truth becomes so planted into your heart, it becomes you and part of your being, part of your spiritual DNA. That's where transformation comes. Meditation is when we take the written word of God that's written on a page and we meditate and we ponder and we think about and we process and we voice until the truth on a page becomes a truth written on our heart. And the very revelation Paul had becomes the very revelation we have. Ownership. And when you have ownership of God's word in your heart, you will not fall away from God. You will be a tree planted beside streams of water whose fruit gives birth or is produced in season because you have the Word of God written on your heart. Now let's turn to James chapter, James chapter 1, verse 21. James 1, verse 21. Again, James is emphasizing the importance of, and I believe James 121 is coming from the parable of the sower. I believe he got the idea from the parable of the sower. And James is saying, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, 
in humility receive the word implanted. Now catch this last part. Which is able to save your souls. The word of God in itself. Inherent in the word of God in itself is the ability and the power to transform you. Okay? So you think, okay, I got to change, I got to change, I got to change. And what James is telling us, no, you don't have to change. The word will change you. The word of God has the power inside of itself, in the seed of God's truth. The word has inherent power that is able to save your soul. This is not talking about salvation from damnation. This is talking about sanctification, the salvation of the soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. James is telling us, catch this, that the word of God, when it's planted into your heart, has in and of itself the power of God just contained in that seed to transform you. The problem is the word's not getting planted. And if the word's not planted in your heart, it can't change you. That's where meditation comes in. That's where thinking and pondering and renewing the mind comes in. What, what meditation does is that that's how you get the word planted into your heart. You can't get the word planted into your heart just by hearing a sermon. Okay, we need to hear that again. You cannot get the Word of God planted into your heart just by hearing a sermon. Now, I guess if you heard the sermon like a hundred times, then that Word could get planted in you. But just hearing the sermon one Sunday cannot get the Word of God planted in you. Reading the Bible, as important as it is, cannot get the word planted in you. It takes an immersive process of reading those scriptures and owning it, possessing it, and saying, God, plant that in my heart. And when that word gets planted in your heart, what happens is, when that word gets planted in your heart, what happens is the word of God itself has the power of God to transform you. You don't have to try to change yourself. You need to focus on getting the truth into your heart. Planting, meditating, pondering until the revelation written on the page is the revelation written on your heart. Until what the authors who wrote the Bible, when they were inspired to write and they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit, that revelation is now yours and you have ownership of that truth in your heart. When that happens, James says, it has the power in and of itself to save your soul, to conform you in your thinking, in your emotions, in your choices, to conform you and to shape you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. How incredible is that? Get back. Again, we need to read the Bible. We need to study the Bible. But we also need to add into that discipline meditating on the Bible, voicing, pondering, praying, singing, uh, writing, getting it so deep that it, it engages the heart and the mind and the brain and it begins to transform, metamorphosize us from a carnal, soulish state into a spiritual state who has been liberated by the truth of God's word. Here's a prayer that, that I prayed recently. That I, I just want to encourage you to pray this prayer. Even if you're like, okay, I'm kind of struggling knowing how do I get started? How do I get started in biblical meditation? As you're going through the word and something really stands off to you, stands up, out of, leaps off the page to you, take, take, you know, ask the Lord and say, Lord, let these truths on a page become my truth in my heart ownership, forming and shaping my heart beliefs. Because we'll talk about this later. What you believe in your heart 
always bubbles up into your thinking. Thoughts come from the heart. And so what you ultimately believe in your heart eventually and always comes into your mind, into your thinking. And when it comes into your thinking, it comes into your actions. When it comes into your actions, it becomes a habit. And when it becomes a habit, it becomes a character. And when it becomes your character, it becomes your destiny. So forming heart beliefs by meditation is of vital importance. Okay, let these truths on a page become my truth in my heart, forming and shaping my heart beliefs, renewing my mind, activating faith. Remember what we talked about last Sunday is this process of meditation, of acknowledging, um, of the, the knowledge of what's good inside of you, acknowledging that, that activates faith. The law of the mind and the law of faith go hand in hand is faith is how you experience the truth of what's already in you, the truth of what Jesus accomplished for you on the cross, the truth of what he did in your spirit, the truth of who he is in you. See, when you begin to meditate, what happens is you activate faith. And when you activate faith, that's when God begins to move. Like Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, he said, that the, he said, I pray for you that your inner man would be strengthened with the might and the power of God so that, that Christ, he may dwell in your heart. How? By faith. Christ will not dwell in your heart if there's not faith. If you don't believe that he's in you, if you don't believe that he's, your spirit is one with him, if you don't believe of who this one is inside of you, if you don't believe that, the spirit of the Lord is suppressed from filling you because unbelief hinders God. And the best way to get victory over doubt and unbelief is to renew the mind because renewing the mind, the law of the mind, activates faith and faith is how God acts and operates. God has always acted by faith. Read Hebrews chapter 11. From the very, very beginning, God has put it into his word. It is the law of faith. God does not act apart from faith on your behalf. You've got, to act, you've got to live in faith. If you live in faith, God, God moves. Now, there's faith for promises. There's faith for breakthrough. But I'm talking really in this class, faith for the facts of what God has already accomplished on, on the cross for you and faith in the facts of what he's already done in your spirit and faith in the reality of the one who dwells in you. Amen. Amen. I just encourage you, make that a regular part of your prayer. So think about this, for example. Here, Romans 6, verse 6, says that the old man, Paul said, knowing this, the old man has been crucified with him. So that the body of, the body of sin would be rendered powerless. So Paul was saying, knowing this, that the body of sin has been crucified with him. And then in verse 11, he says, therefore reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. That word reckon actually is a word used about word used that if you if you look into the Greek is a word used that really involves this process of meditation. The reckoning process that Paul is saying in Romans 6:11 to reckon yourself dead, to reckon yourself alive is a meditative process. Think about it deeply. Think about it in prayer. I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, I died in him. When Jesus was buried, I was buried with him. When Jesus died, I died in him. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, I was resurrected in him. Now I have newness of life. Now I can walk in newness of life. Now I can live by his life because I am dead to sin and alive to God. Confess that. Meditate on that. Just even what I'm doing right now. If you see what I'm doing right now, I'm actually meditating. And as I'm meditating, my faith is being stirred up. You see what I'm saying? Voice it. Become your favorite preacher. Become your favorite writer. You know, again, like I said last Sunday, we love hearing ourselves talk. All of us love to hear ourselves talk. We have, a, we have 
But God's given us two ears and one mouth for a reason. He wants us to listen more than talk. But when it comes to meditation, God gives you permission to talk. Talk. Because, you know, just listen to what you're speaking. Speak to yourself. David in the Psalms would speak to his soul and say, say tell his soul, be quiet, soul. Soul, remember God. You've got to speak sometimes to your soul. You've got to speak sometimes to your thinking. You've got to speak to your emotions. You've got to speak to yourself. Now, if you do it too much, people will think you're crazy. But, you know, find a place where you're not interrupting people and they're not looking at you like you're crazy. But we've got to learn to speak. We've got to learn to voice the truth. See, meditation takes... These two truths that I just mentioned, you are crucified with Jesus Christ. You have been, past tense, crucified. Well, I don't really feel crucified. You are alive to God. I don't really feel alive to God. Well, what faith does, what meditation does, is it says, it doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter how you think, right? It doesn't matter if you feel it or you don't feel it. Meditation says, this word is true. God says, I'm crucified. God says, I'm alive in him. Therefore, I am going to ponder this. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to just revolve my mind around it over and over and over and over until that truth becomes alive in my heart. Faith is awakened and activated, and then God begins to make that experience real in you. Your, your legal position in Christ, crucified, dead to sin, alive to God, becomes your living condition by the Spirit of God when faith is awakened in you through meditation. Faith substantiates the reality of God inside of you. See, faith substantiates. Faith is what makes it real in your experience. If all you do is believe, if all you do is have head knowledge of it, it's never going to do, make any transformational experience in your life. This truth must be experienced by faith. The problem is, is you don't believe, you know, the problem is we don't believe what God's word says. You are a new creation. You are a partaker of the divine nature. Your spirit is one spirit with the Holy Spirit. You have resurrection power in you. You have creative power. You have power for ability. You have God's grace inside of you. You're dead to sin, alive to God. You've been seated with Christ in heavenly places. The problem is we don't believe it because we either forget it or we don't remind ourselves through meditation to renew the mind over and over and over. And so what happens is the spirit of the age conforms us naturally because we're not taking decisive action to renew the mind. Most of the church thinks like the world because we're not practicing Romans 12 too. Most of the church today is not much different at all from the world because we're not transforming the mind by meditation. See, meditation always leads to transformation. There is a transformation God does. As you behold the glory of the Lord, you are, you are changed into his image from glory to glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. That's a transformation God does. There's also a transformation you do by meditation. Paul didn't say, wait on God to transform you. He said, no. It was a, this, listen, this was an apostolic command. It was not a suggestion. It was not a like, okay, here's 10 principles to a better life. Here's not like pop psychology is how to be a better you. No, Paul, writing by the Spirit of the Lord to all Christians, was telling us, don't be, listen, listen to the command of it. This is, it's the apostolic command. Do not be conformed to this world. He's saying it, listen, he's saying it even to the end time church with authority. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to Babylon that's rising up. Do not be conformed to the decadence that's being pushed in, by Western culture. Do not be conformed by the spirit of the age. The commandment of God, be transformed. Hear the word of God, be transformed. Be transformed. Be metamorphu. Be metamorphosized. 
from the state of the flesh into the state of the spirit, from the caterpillar to the butterfly. Be metamorphosized by the renewing of your mind. That's something we must do. I can't do this for you. Your wife can't do this for you, though she may want to do this for you. You can't. The pastor can't do it for you. The elders can't do it for you. Your parents can't do it for you. The only one that can renew your mind is you, and God says, renew your mind. Put this into your practice. Put this into your prayer life. Put this into your daily routine, routine just like as you would never leave to go out on your, to start your day to go to school or to work if you didn't brush your teeth and comb your hair and put on deodorant. Don't leave your house without spending time meditating, without spending time in prayer revolving your mind around the truth. Just take one truth. You don't have to do the whole Bible. Just take one truth and spend, you know, a week just meditating and thinking and pondering until that is then part of your heart. That's part of your spiritual DNA. It leads to transformation. The Greek word when Paul wrote in Romans 12:2, when Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, this Greek word comes from a word that means to cause to grow up. See, when you begin to think differently and you begin to meditate, what happens is you're growing up from a child of God into a mature son of God. It's causing you to grow up. It also means to make new, to be changed into a new kind of life as opposed to the former corrupt state. See, as you begin to meditate, you begin to mature. As you begin to meditate, you begin to mature. As you begin to get the truth in your heart, you begin to grow up. As you renew your mind, you change states. You become more and more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. See, what meditation does is it draws out the newness of your spirit out of you instead of allowing the oldness of the corrupt state of the flesh to live. See, when Jesus was metamorphosed, when Jesus was transfigured, that word is actually the same word as metamorphy that Paul used in Romans chapter 12. Jesus did not change into another person. He changed into another state. He changed into this human form into the glory of God. And it was so intense that the disciples fell down and were afraid because of the fear of God came upon them. Jesus metamorphosized. And when you meditate, you likewise metamorphosize. You metamorphosize into the state that's already true about you in your spirit. That state is released from your spirit outward into your heart, into your soul, into your body, and it metamorphosizes you. You can have that experience of metamorphosis by meditation every single day. You don't have to wait to go, come to church on Sunday. You don't have to wait until you hear a preacher. You don't have to go to YouTube. You don't have to pull out a book. You can go pull out the Bible, and you can metamorphosize every single day. In fact, we're meant to metamorphosize every single day. We're meant to change the state from the carnal to the spiritual every single day. You with me still? Now let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. I want, to see, I want you to see it again. We're just showing it over and over and over. It's a common, very, very common theme in, in Scripture. Romans or Ephesians 4, 24. I, I love, or we're going to start with... Uh, Verse 22, I, I love Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Paul is writing in Ephesians 4, 20, 4, 22, that in reference to your manner of life, your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. So let me stop there and just say this. 
even as a born-again Christian, your flesh is in a constant process of decay by the lust of the flesh. Did you realize that? Well, I thought I was born again. You are, but not your, your body is not born again. Your body is in the same condition it was before you became a Christian. Your body is in this continuous corruption. It's in this state. It's in this present tense state of being corrupted by the lust of deceit. In other words, Paul's telling us lusts are at work in your human body, and those lusts are deceiving you. And then verse 23, I want you to catch it, because this is what, this is what Paul's telling us. You think about verse 22 is the old state. Verse 22 is a caterpillar state. How do you move from being a caterpillar to a butterfly? How do you move from that? Verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you put off the old man? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you change from a caterpillar to a butterfly? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You see, Paul's telling us how to, how to do it. See, so many, I've heard people ask this time, well, how do you actually, give me a practical way of how to put off the old man. How do I do this practically? Well, Paul tells us right here. It's by renewing the mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And this, look at what he says in verse 23 or 24. Put on the new self. And how he describes it is beautiful. In the likeness of God. And I just put in parentheses, in, the, in conformity to Jesus Christ. And God recreated this new man, this new spirit in you. He conformed you into the image of Jesus Christ. It's been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So what you have now is you have a choice between the old man the old self, in a constant state of corruption, being corrupted in this ever-present state by the lust of deceit, or you can live in this new man, how beautiful is it, that has already been created, not waiting for heaven. Inside of you, your spirit is righteous. Inside of you, your spirit is holy. Inside of you, your spirit is Christ-like. Already God has done that. Well, how do you get it out of me? How do you get it to be released? How do you get it active? By renewing the mind. By renewing the mind. Renewing the mind is how you take off the old man and put on the new man. See, meditation draws out the treasure of Jesus Christ out of you. The wealth you have inside of you, that wealth is meant to come out. So you live in spiritual wealth instead of spiritual poverty. Do you realize even as a born-again Christian, if you don't know or if you don't draw out the life of Jesus Christ, you can be a spiritual billionaire but live in poverty. How many Christians in America, how many Christians in the Western world are living in spiritual poverty, being billionaires but living on a penny a day, spiritually speaking, because they're not drawing out the life of Jesus Christ that is already inside of them? So there, I, I read this stat. Is, is, here's the way I think about this. Is, you know, we get these gift cards for Christmas. And by the way, if you don't know what to buy people, it's better to give them a gift card than give them something like a bunny suit like in the Christmas story or something they'll never use that's going to be sold on eBay or something. Get them a gift card. But there's a problem with gift cards is I, I read this stat that, that um, more than half of U.S. adults, 51%, they never use their gift cards. That adds up, adds up to over $15 billion. $15 billion. I think Randall brought this analogy up when he preached a couple years ago. just stuck with me. Over $15 billion of unused prepaid gift cards. Never used. What a waste. But that's what it's like for most Christians. 
We've got a prepaid gift card for millions and millions, billions of dollars. And yet the treasure of Jesus Christ lays suppressed within us because we don't use the gift card to exchange it for us, for the life of Christ. Well, how do we use the gift card? By meditation. By renewing the mind. By being renewed in the spirit of the mind. That's how we use this gift card. See, when we meditate, we're not trying to brainwash ourselves into thinking something that's not true. We're not, nor are we trying to like coerce God into doing something for us. No, these things are already true about you. Renewing the mind is remembering who you are. Because we forget. We forget who we are. We forget who we are in Jesus Christ. We forget what he's done for us. We forget who he is in us. We forget how he has transformed us. Renewing the mind is the act of remembering who you are and who he is in you that brings this transformation to you. Incredible. Meditation focuses your mind on the greatness of Christ in you and the glory of his finished work in your spirit. Meditation also removes hindrances. See, the life of God is inside of you, but the life of God can be suppressed. The life of God can be dormant. The river of living water that could flow out of you can remain a, a pond or whatever that's suppressed. So how do we get rid of these hindrances? It reminds me of this time when we moved into our new house. About a year after we moved into our new house, I got a call when I was having to go into the office a couple days a week, three days a week, and I got a call from Angie in a panic. And she's like, you will not believe this. She was really traumatized. And she's like, you will not believe this. I just was cleaning the bathroom, the bathroom drain, the bathtub drain, and I pulled out this like lengthy snake skin. I mean like really long. Like, I don't remember exactly how long, but since I'm preaching, it's like from that corner of the stage to that corner of the stage. It was like a, a python. No, it wasn't that big. But it, was, it really was really big. I think she showed it to me. I was like, ooh, that's terrible. And I mean, I, and you know, first when she called me, I was like, wow, okay, calm down, calm down. But when she told me, I was like, okay, I hate snakes, she hates snakes, we both hate snakes. So I can see why you're panicked, okay? So anyway, I think for about, a, I don't know, I probably, one of those things where we didn't really, com, you know, confess this, but when you lay down on your head at night, you kind of felt like you were sleeping in Indiana Jones, that snake pit in Indiana Jones, you know? And just, it was just like, uh, I was tormented by that. But you know, like, you know, that's, that's, the, the, I was using that analogy, it's basically like the, the, the drain needs to be unclogged. See, that the, the men, there's mental barriers that we have. These mental roadblocks can be mindsets rooted in pride. I can do it, independence, selfishness. I want what I want the way I want it, or I don't, I don't need God's help, or they can be rooted in rejection. I'm unworthy. I've, I, you know, I've been rejected. People don't love me. I reject myself. You know, those kind of things. There's all these things wrong with me. There's things wrong with my body, my looks, my thinking, and, you know, people don't like me. Or there can be rooted in jealousy or in this comparison trap where you're just comparing this person's more blessed than I am, and you get jealous, you get envious because they might have more influence, more cars, more money, a better family, whatever it is. And we get in this comparison trap, or we might feel unworthy where we just feel like I'm this hopeless hypocrite. God's mad at me all the time. I'm under condemnation. I'll never do it. You know, and, or I'll never be able to do what God wants me to do. Or we might have experienced you know, trauma or abuse or fear. Or there's a million different things. Anxiety, depression, control. All these different mindsets we can have that are hindrances to the life of God living in you. In other words, I've just described you've got this wealth inside of you, but these mindsets. A mindsets that, that control you. Mindsets of fear, mindsets 
of anxiety, mindsets of pride, mindsets of depression, mindsets of rejection, unworthiness that hinder that flow of release. The problem is God's here. He wants to be released out, but the mind with its clogging, the snake skin, so to speak, is blocking the flow of, of the water from flowing. And so the way to the way to the to breakthrough, the way to release is for that for the life of God to be released, the way for that life to be released is you must unclog those hindrances. And the, you know, speaking of snakes, there's have you ever I don't know if you guys have seen this the uh, drain snake. It's this plastic thing you can get at Home Depot for like a dollar. Those things are awesome because what happens is, you know, two or three times a year, our shower will all of a sudden get you know, stopped up, and, you know, the, the water, and Anna's probably looking at me, yeah, it's because you're going bald, and I'm losing hair, so it's clogging the drain. Were you thinking that? But uh, <laughs> anyway, the, this hair starts getting stopped up, and so you got to take off the, the little drain thing and start getting this drain snake to pull out all, all the hair, so then once you pull up all the hair, the water can then flow free, freely through the drain. And that's the way meditation is. Meditation, renewing the mind, targets, like, you know, targets mindsets. What mindset, what three mindsets is it that you struggle with most? You know, just, you got to start somewhere. I mean, it could be, you could say, well, I, everyone you just listed, I struggle with all of them, okay? Probably all of us do, but which are the ones that really, really affect you most? Is it negative thinking? You know, bad things always happen to me. Expectation that you're expecting the worst. You're expecting, you're expecting bad things to happen. Everything's going to break. You know, whatever it could be. It could be a million things. What are the top three mindsets that you believe are hindrances to you from experiencing the life of Christ? And what is the truth you need to wage war with against those mindsets? Rejection, for example. I've been rejected I, people don't like me, you know, I'm, not me, I'm just saying, maybe you're thinking this. I've been rejected, and people don't like me, and God's mad at me, and, you know, my parents rejected me, or my friends rejected me, or my husband rejected me, or my wife rejected me, and you've got this rejection mindset built up, and so when you're rooted in rejection, when you are rooted in rejection, the root of rejection always produces the fruit of criticism, judgment, uh, condemnation, you know, comparison, jealousy, because you're rooted in this mindset of rejection rather than rooted in the love of God. Well, the truth is, the truth is the devil says no one likes you, you're unworthy, you know, you've got all these problems, these things have happened to you, these people rejected you because you're not worth anything, you're worthless. Well, you've got to combat those lies with the truth, what does God say about you? God says about you, you are beloved. You are beloved in Jesus Christ. God is madly in love with you. He will root you and ground you in his love. He will shower you with his love. He will unveil the love, his love for you, his personal love. God's word to you is, is even before you think a thought, I know it. I am intimately acquainted with all of your ways. I knew you even before you were born, and I loved you even before you were born. You are chosen in me. You are my beloved. You are the one I love. Well, see, you've got to renew your mind from the lies that says I'm rejected, I'm worthless, I'm hopeless, to what God says about you. He says about you, you are beloved, and you are chosen, and you are dearly, dearly precious to him. So you could bring out a million different things. You could apply that to fear, anxiety, control, pride. That, and we'll, we'll get into this later, um, in, in later sessions. But the point of this is that these thinking patterns, these thinking patterns must be combated with truth so that the, the life of God in you can be released and there's nothing blocking the drain from flowing. There's no blockage, there's no hindrance from the water flowing freely from you know, in, in the tub analogy is flowing this way down, but in my analogy is flowing this way up. There's no blockage. There's no hindrance. The life of God is flowing out of you freely. That river of living water is flowing out of you freely. And meditation, thinking different, thinking about the truth is how you 
release the life of God in you. Amen? See, meditation shifts your state. Meditation shifts your state. If you learn to meditate upon your condition in Christ, or, or let me start with this. If you learn to meditate upon your position in Christ, and what I mean by that is who you are in him, that you are crucified, you are resurrected, you are ascended, you are enthroned, you are righteous in him, you are victorious in him. Begin to meditate on who you are in Christ. When God puts you into Christ by his own doing, when God puts you into Christ by his own doing, meditate on those realities. Meditate on your condition in Christ. Meditate on your condition in Christ that God has transformed my spirit. My spirit is resurrected, righteous, holy, complete, one spirit with Christ, a partaker of the divine nature. See, even if you have to say this every single day, don't ever get bored with it. Don't ever let it become routine. These are, these are incredible realities. And meditate on who Christ is in you. He is a river of living water. He is Shekinah glory. He is enabling grace. He is the power of resurrection. He is the helper. He is the anointing. He is the kingdom of God in you. Christ in you in his glory and in his majesty. Meditate upon Christ in you. And what happens is whenever you do that, you will, I promise you, you will change states. Some of us have built up in our brains. Remember I talked about in the first session that the brain and the mind are different. But you can actually rewire your brain by learning to think different, by, by changing your heart beliefs, changing your mind. You can rewire your brain from the negative uh, thoughts that you've had for so much of your life. I think I shared in the first uh, session last week that 80 or 90, is it 90, 80? 80% 80 of our thoughts are negative. 80% of our thoughts are negative. That's, I mean... You know, and, and what's happened is just, you know, just throughout life, we've developed thinking patterns that have become so a part of us, we can't even separate those thinking patterns from who God sees us and what God says about us. We've developed these thinking patterns rooted in insecurity, rooted in unworthiness, rooted in rejection, rooted in fear, rooted in depression, rooted in selfishness or pride or jealousy or lust, whatever it is. We've developed these thinking patterns that unless, and what's happened, it's actually rewired our brain. Our brain is now uh, fixated upon those thinking patterns, and we've got to renew the mind, renew the heart beliefs, and when it does that, it, can ch it, um, it actually can change the way your thoughts work in your brain. There's scientific studies that talk about that. And so that's the power of meditation. But here's the thing is, you've got to be committed to this for the rest of your life. It's not something you do 15 minutes one day and go, well, that didn't really work. Now, you've been thinking this way for, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and you're, you've been, your whole system of thinking is shaped and conformed to this pattern of thought that is not aligned with God's word, and you can't just, like, get victory over this in five minutes. You can't just get victory over this and think, okay, well, I tried it, it didn't work. No, you've got to be committed to it the rest of your life. And I'm talking about learning in your, in your prayer time with the Lord, incorporating biblical meditation into your prayer life. Learning, not only are you asking God for things, not only are you listening to God to see what he's going to speak, but you're engaging in a conversation with God based on his word, meditating on his word, so that you can be transformed. You can change your state. And you can release the life of Christ that is within you. But here, and I'll close with this. You must be committed. Again, I'm drilling this in. I'm drilling it in. It has to become a habit. Just like exercise needs to become a habit. Or you know, eating healthy needs to become a habit or 
whatever these habits we need, we need. This biblical meditation must be a habit that is established in your prayer life. Otherwise, you're never go- you, you can't just like go out on the run and you know sing a few songs and think, okay, I'm going to be changed. I'm not really changed. No, you've got to take decisive action for the rest of your life. I'm going to incorporate this. This is part of my prayer life. You know, just make it as simple as this. I pray every single day. Maybe you pray for 30 minutes. Maybe you pray for an hour. Maybe, you, let's, say you, let's say you spend 30 minutes in prayer every single day as part of, you just start the morning in prayer. And you start the morning in prayer and you say, okay, well, 10 minutes I'm going to devote to learning to meditate and learning to think different. And getting these truths, where, are you, where is it you're struggling? Is it pride? Is it rejection? Is it fear? And learning to find out the truth of what God's word says about the particular thing you're battling with to, to begin to meditate on it and to begin to think about it and then realize, oh, wait, I'm believing a lie right here. This lie is what I'm believing. I'm believing, you know, I don't even know what it would be, but I'm believing this set of complex lies that people have told me, the devil has told me, you're not good enough, you're unworthy, you'll never do it, you're a failure, you're, you know, you're rejected, whatever, and you're, and you're saying, Though I have believed these lies for so long. See, if you're struggling, if you're struggling and you're going through something and you feel like you're going through this, this crisis, most likely what's happened is you are believing a complex set of lies somewhere that you've been believing for a while and that belief system in your heart has filtered up into your mind and affected your actions. And the way to overcome that is to renew your mind, renew your beliefs, renew it based on the truth of God's word and to, and to fight against that and to incorporate it into your life and make it a habit, make it part of your prayer life. Amen? So we're going to, we'll end there. I just want to pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the incredible truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that the righteous person will live by faith. Lord, that we would live by faith, that you would expose to us, Lord, lies we believe. Just just ask the Lord right now, whether you're listening online or in person, just ask the Lord to expose lies that you have been believing. Lies about God. Lies about yourself, lies about others, lies about the future, lies. It could be a million different things, but just make this a prayer request. It's even homework. Lord, show us. Just ask the Lord, show me, show us. God, these thinking patterns of lies, these complex set of lies that I'm believing about me about myself, about God, about others. Lord, that you would just really show me lies that I'm believing. And Lord, would you also lead me into the truth of your word that would combat that exact lie that the devil has been pushing on me and I've bit into for years. Lord, would you just begin to expose those lies? Lord, would you begin to reveal those lies, Lord? Just make this a real matter of prayer over the next few weeks to begin to even incorporating into this process when you feel as if, okay, I'm going through this funk. I'm going through this time where I just feel like I'm just going through these things. Okay, why am I, what, what is it I'm believing? Always ask yourself that. Okay, if you're going through a bad day, a bad week, and if you're going through even longer than that, a bad year, and you're just in this funk, ask yourself the question, what lies am I believing? And write those out. Ask the Lord to help you. Lord, Lord, help me to show me, Lord, what lies I'm believing. Show me, Lord, what lies I'm believing. Write those lies out and then find in the scriptures what the truth is that would come and wage war against those lies and then begin meditating on those truths 
until you begin to think differently and believe differently. And then you, what you realize is now, you know what? You're, you won't feel this in one day. Three months later, six months later, if you'll be committed to it a year later of practicing day in and day out, what will happen is you will look back and you'll say, you know what? I don't, even, I don't struggle with that anymore. What's happened is you've rewired your brain, you've rewired your heart, you've rewired your mind to, to be conformed to truth. So, Lord, I'm asking you to do that in us. I'm asking you, Lord, do that work in us, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, do that work in us. I pray that, that you would shine the light of your truth, the light of your word into our hearts, Lord, and illuminate those areas, God. I'm asking you to do that, Lord, in Jesus' name. May the truth set all of us free, that the life of Jesus Christ would flow out of us as a river of living water, I pray. That people who are listening, Lord, online, in person, all of us, God, we would begin to have our faith reactivated, reset. I just believe even as I'm praying this that, it's, that the Lord is saying is, that if you will really heed this advice, that the Lord will do a reset in your life and he will give you, he will, as you activate your faith, it'll be as if you've entered into a new day. It's a new day for some of you, a new day. God's doing a new thing. It's a new day. And if you will believe it, if you will believe it and you will practice this and you will enter into this, this process of meditation, then God will change you. God will set you free. Lord, I just pray that for everyone, that this would be a time of freedom, freedom, we ask, Lord. And we just say that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 We'll end the online portion here.